So it was the national elections and one member of parliament was electioneering hard for a second term in office. And one day after a busy morning chasing votes and no lunch, he arrived at a church braai. It was late afternoon and the MP was famished. And as the MP moved down the serving line, he held out his plate to the woman who was serving the chicken. And she put a piece on his plate and turned to the next person in line. Excuse me, the MP said, do you mind if I have another piece of chicken? Sorry, the woman told him, I'm supposed to give one piece of chicken to each person. But I'm starved, the MP said. Sorry, the woman said again, only one to a customer. The MP was a modest and unassuming man, but he decided that this time he'd throw a little weight around. Do you know who I am, he said. I'm the member of parliament for this constituency. And do you know who I am, the woman answered. I'm the lady in charge of the chicken. Move along, mister. Now the MP and the lady in charge of the chicken each tries to exert authority over the other by revealing his or her identity, who each is, and emphatically demanding, do you know who I am? In the Gospel reading of today, Jesus asked the same question as regards to his identity. Who do you say I am? but it's in a completely different context. Jesus was not exerting personal authority over them, but asking of these men who had shared his life for an extended time a simple and straightforward question. On the 1st of November this year, South Africa will have our sixth municipal elections held since the end of apartheid in 1994. And if we meet with the politicians running for the elections, for ward councillors and all those things, we will see them putting on their best face, um, putting their best face forward to try and earn nominations and votes. But none of them will be talking about making sacrifices for the common good. An experienced political and consultant would strongly discourage that. Are you crazy? I say, you'll, you'll never win votes that way. After Jesus speaks about his upcoming suffering and Peter's rebuke, he addresses the crowd and he says, whoever wishes to come after me must deny self Take up the cross and follow me. And the same political consultant might say to Jesus, Are you crazy? You'll never win followers that way. No one wants to accept suffering if they can avoid it. But Jesus was not holding back or softening his message. And later when Mark was writing about this, he tells us, Jesus spoke this openly. And it seems God's call to service also includes sacrifice. A, willing, a disciple willing to suffer for their vocation speaks a clear message to the world. God is worth the cost. Isaiah presents to us a suffering servant for our consideration. In order to stir his contemporaries to hear God's word, the servant endures their rejection, mockery and beatings. God has good intentions towards the people of Israel in exile and slavery. And despite being met with severe rejection by those who most need to hear God's good intentions for them, the suffering servant endures the wrath of the very ones he has been sent to help. And with that in mind, we've got Peter identifying Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah, the one God has finally sent to free the people from bondage. 
According to the Bible, that seems to be God's job description, to free and raise up the beaten down. So Peter has got the right answer to the question of Jesus. Peter says that Jesus is the Messiah, but Peter doesn't understand how Jesus will accomplish his, his mission, which is by self-sacrificing love. In Peter's mind, that wasn't supposed to be how God would come to rescue his people, not through suffering. That was unthinkable. A suffering Messiah? No way. Where's the triumph in that? So we, of course, realize that there's more to the message. It's bad enough that Isaiah's suffering servant and Jesus are going to accomplish their mission through suffering. But Jesus tells his disciples that those who follow him will have to do the same. The task he has given them will require some self-sacrifice. As I said, if Jesus were running for political office with that kind of talk, he probably would not have gotten a single vote. Would you have voted for him? At this point in the gospel, Peter certainly would not. Now, it's not that we disciples are masochists who perversely enjoy suffering. Absolutely not. Suffering is no friend. It's not something we will want to choose. But if we are willing to embrace suffering when it comes as a result of our Christian choices, it can have a redemptive effect and enable us to be centered on Christ and to the God that, that Christ came to reveal to us. In the normal course of events, we'd want to experience only joy all the time. But in the real world we live in, we can also experience sorrow and suffering as well because this is the condition of the world that we live in. And the danger can be that we abandon God at the first experience of any suffering. So we remind ourselves how Jesus completely immersed himself in our human condition, even experiencing suffering and transforming that experience into a total expression of God's love for us all. So how close to us is God? God became flesh. The God who created us sustains us and with every breath we take will judge us and give us eternal joy. But ours is not a distant, uncaring God. God is not watching us at a distance. Rather, God has taken flesh to show us just how close God is to us. Nor did God in Jesus withdraw or avoid suffering, but by accepting it showed us our, how absolutely close God is to us. The Gospels were written to help believers like us to understand who Jesus is and what faith in him means. And judging from the question that Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? And Jesus' critical response to him, the question Jesus may be asking us today is, what are you willing to suffer for your belief in me? Now we are not going to be nailed to a cross for our faith in Jesus, but we are asked to make deliberate even costly choices because of him. And making a choice for Jesus means accepting both the joys and sorrows of this life, not just joys. It means living all of the experiences of life with meaning, with purpose. If I don't have Jesus in my life, if I don't understand the purpose of my life, I can get easily tripped up into selfishness, into discontent, a sense of being lost, which easily leads to hopelessness. To believe in Jesus is to be like him. Just as his way of life caused him to suffer, so if you follow Jesus, we're also asked to accept the consequences. 
after Peter named Jesus the Christ and Jesus spoke about his upcoming suffering and death Peter took him aside and rebuked him said well in other words he said Jesus this really can't happen this is really not fair this is not right and that's when Jesus spoke sternly to Peter in the hearing of the other disciples saying get behind me Satan for us that's quite shocking those are very very strong words but we need to understand that in the scriptures Satan became the name used for the devil but originally Satan was the word used to describe an obstacle blocking one's path so at this point Peter's trying to block Jesus on his path to Jerusalem to his suffering to his death on the cross and Jesus is reminding Peter to stop being an obstacle in front of him to go back where a disciple should be behind Jesus following him on his way and what Jesus reminds Peter is also a reminder for us we are to be disciples that is to do what Jesus does and in the way that he does it and if we need clarification Jesus spells out the role of the disciple explicitly whoever wishes to come after me must deny self take up their cross and follow me for whoever wishes to save their life will lose it and whoever loses their life for my sake and that of the gospel will save it look our reaction is isn't that a contradiction to an outsider yes but to those following behind Jesus as best as we can we know what he's talking about and if we have willingly taken up the cross serving and loving in Jesus name then we know what it means to have our lives saved 